Good afternoon and welcome to the second webinar in our confidential information series. Before we start the webinar, we have a few small housekeeping points. Firstly, to keep background noise down, we've placed each of you on mute. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end, but you can also use the chat function throughout the presentation to post any questions that you might have and we'll pick them up at the end. As I mentioned, this is the second webinar in our series focusing on confidential information. That's part of a wider series of webinars from the commercial litigation team. The final webinar in this series will focus on preventing misuse of confidential information, and webinars from previous series are available if you follow the link shown on screen. Your speakers today are John McKenzie and me, Matt Phillip. John and I work in the Commercial Disputes team and regularly advise clients about confidentiality clauses in contracts, including how to protect it and action that can be taken when it's been misused. In today's webinar, we're going to look at practical ways that a business can try to maintain the necessary quality of confidence needed for a document to benefit from legal protection under the law of confidence. The format of the webinar is shown on the screen. We'll start by recapping the last seminar, looking at what makes information confidential and what tests the courts apply. The definition of the necessary quality of confidence will be central to this webinar as it determines the standard which has to be maintained in order for documents to be protected. We'll then go on to examine how, once the necessary standard of confidential information has been met, this can then be maintained. This will be done by looking at some cases and also looking at some of the practical steps that can be taken to ensure that information remains confidential rather than it becoming part of the general knowledge associated with a business or a particular sector. Of particular interest to us will be how businesses can put parties on notice, both implicitly and explicitly, that certain information is considered confidential. It will be important to consider when duties of confidentiality are owed within employment contracts and uh, more widely. As we will come to see, different types of confidential information will have different levels of protection. The Court's decisions on these issues are also highly instructive about how specific employers need to be in their confidential confidentiality clauses in order to rely on them. We'll be looking at the protection of documents that are stored internally, the best ways to protect documents that are tr transmitted to a third party, and practical advice on IT solutions, document storage and management procedures. In the last webinar, we discussed the phrase necessary quality of confidence briefly. In order to achieve this, two conditions must be met. First, the information cannot be public knowledge. What this means uh, is any information that exists in the public domain. Second, uh, the information must be given in circumstances which show that there is an obligation of confidence. We'd previously looked at the case of CF Partners and Barclays in relation to this point. Essentially, the test applied by the courts is the reasonable man test. The court will ask whether the reasonable man, standing in the shoes of the recipient of the information, would have realized that the information was given to him in confidence. Where our information passes these tests, then, on the face of it, the information is confidential. The next issue is how do we keep it confidential? The first issue to think about is what makes the information confidential. Broadly, when thinking about confidentiality, you can split business information into three categories. This is useful because it helps to determine the protection that's likely to be afforded to the information and any remedies available for any breach of the duty of confidentiality. Firstly, and as discussed in the last webinar, are trade secrets, which sit at the top and are afforded the greatest protection. Second is confidential information, which has some but not all of the features of a trade secret and is thus not given the same level of protection. And finally, there's other information of the employer that's not confidential at all. This categorization becomes more relevant when looking at the first issue we're going to cover, which is how to protect confidential information from being misused by people who are given access to it within the business. The starting point in this area is the case of Fakenda Chicken Limited and Fowler. Fakenda bred, slaughtered and sold chickens. And their employee, Mr Fowler, resigned from his post and set up his own chicken wholesale operation using the confidential sales information that he had obtained during his employment with Fakenda. The question asked was whether or not the information was still protected despite Mr Fowler no longer being employed by Fakenda. The court held that it was not. The court identified the three categories mentioned above. The first was that the information was not confidential, 
In relation to confidential information, the court classified confidential information in the field of employment contracts as falling into two categories. The first was information the employee must treat as confidential, either because he's told it's confidential or because from its character it's obviously so, but which, once learnt, remains in the employee's head and becomes part of his own skill and knowledge applied in the course of the employer's business. The employee cannot otherwise use or disclose such information during the course of employment without breaching his obligations to the employer. However, after leaving employment, the employee can use their full skill and knowledge for the benefit, or for their own benefit or in competition with his ex-employer. The second category was information amounted to a trade secret, which, even though they have been learnt by heart, may not, even after termination of the employment contract, be used for anyone's benefit except that of the ex-employer. On appeal, the court in Fakenda also drew a distinction between trade secrets and mere confidential information. It held that the ex-employee might be prevented from disclosing information like secret processes of manufacture, such as chemical formulae, or designs or special methods of construction, and other information which is of a sufficiently high degree of confidentiality as to amount to a trade secret. However, it did not extend to information which was only confidential in the sense that an unauthorised disclosure during employment would have been a breach of the duty of good faith owed, by the, owed to the employer. This highlights the difference in the protection that trade secrets enjoy over mere confidential information. Trade secrets are protected by an implied duty of confidentiality, even after termination of employment, whereas confidential information must be treated as confidential during the course of but not following termination of the employment. In Fakenda's case, Mr Fowler would not have been able to give a competitor the commercially sensitive information whilst he was employed, but there was nothing to stop him from using the information for his own benefit after he would resigned from his position. When thinking about the best ways to keep information confidential, a common problem faced in many industries is that providing information to employees creates a risk that the information is passed to a competitor or that the employee will leave the business and use the information uh, obtained as a basis to set up in competition. When it comes to employees, there can be both an implied and an explicit duty of confidence uh, not to disclose trade secrets or confidential information. There is an implied duty in all employment contracts, regardless of how senior, senior the employee is, that employees will conduct themselves with fidelity and good faith. Specifically, this means to act honestly towards the employer to disclose to the employer all information relevant to its business, not to make secret profits from the employer's business, to respect the confidentiality of the employer's commercial and business information, and not to compete with the employer's business. When it comes to the extent of the implied uh, confidentiality duty, everything will depend uh, on the type of information involved. For example, information which is clearly confidential and the employee has been expressly told is confidential can be protected with a, without a covenant for the duration of the employment. Of particular interest to senior employees, specifically directors and other employees who have a fiduciary duty to a company, is the duty to disclose their own misconduct should they disclose uh, confidential information. The case of Item Software, UK Limited and Fasili, uh, Mr Fasili sab sabotaged his employer's negotiations with a new software supplier. He did this by disclosing confidential information in an effort to induce the supplier to contract with his own company. Uh, as the sales and marketing director for Item Software, uh, the court held that Mr. Fasihi had a fiduciary duty to his employer, and thus he had a duty to disclose that he had disclosed company confidential information. While this doesn't necessarily provide much protection, given that disclosure will be after the fact, it does highlight the fact that, regardless of seniority, all employees are subject to an implied duty of confidentiality. Following the termination of employment, the default position is that only one type of business information remains subject to a duty of confidentiality, trade secrets. This will be true regardless of whether there is an undertaking not to disclose and an employer enjoys the same level of protection for a trade secret regardless of whether the employee is current or former. Whilst it is often apparent that there is some form of implied duty of confidentiality, there will always be a grey area in relation to certain types of documents. Some documents are obviously a trade secret and others are clearly public information. 
Those that sit somewhere between these two ends of the spectrum could arguably fall into the category of confidential information, but could also be a part of an employee's skill and knowledge. It is often this uncertainty that results in a court action to determine whether or not they should be afforded any protection and, if so, what that protection should be. This sort of issue is always very fact sensitive, but businesses can help themselves and help to protect their documents if they are able to demonstrate that the context clearly shows that the document was intended to be confidential. This can include having expressed provisions in any contract, including employment contracts, that uh, specific categories of documents are confidential to the point of being a trade secret, that their disclosure is strictly forbidden, and should any disclosure occur, then the business will seek injunctive relief and or damages. The courts have noted that in determining whether or not a document is confidential, express terms to that effect can point the way for the contracting party and for the courts alike in making that determination. If an express term forms part of the employment contract, then it will apply for the duration of employment. The more interesting question is whether it is possible for express duties of confidentiality to remain enforceable after termination of employment. The answer to this question is unclear. Um, as we have already discussed, where a trade secret exists, this will be protected without the need for or the enforcing of an express confidentiality clause. But the law is less clear where the confidential information falls short of being classed as a trade secret. Because of this, it is common for employers to include additional layers of protection in employment contracts through restrictive covenants. This will limit the employee's ability to use any information in their possession for a defined period following the end of the employment relationship. When drafting confidentiality provisions, there are a number of important points that need to be considered. It is worth thinking about the types of information that the employee is likely to require access to as part of their employment and tailor the clause to fit that situation. This can be done in a number of ways, um, but important points to cover are the information specified in the covenant is all information that is classed by the employer as a trade secret. The information is important to the employer and that is why it has taken steps to expressly protect its information. The covenant is not intended to cover information that is already in the public domain. Damages might not be an adequate remedy and that the employer will be entitled to seek injunctive relief and also, if appropriate, that the employee is taking legal advice on the meaning of the undertaking that is being given. In addition to all these factors, there must be a precise definition of what it is that is to be protected. There are many examples of express confidentiality clauses that did not hold up in court because they failed to identify exactly what it was that they sought to protect. Any advisor who drafts these clauses should seek full instructions on the types of information that may be available, information that the employer considers especially confidential, and the reasons for this. Having considered the processes that need to be put in place in order for confidential information to be properly protected internally, the next area to consider is what can be done to protect that confidential information from misuse by third parties. First, we will examine some of the rights and duties that third parties who have been pro provided with confidential, confidential information uh, have. Then we will examine the duties a third party has when it comes into possession of confidential information as a result of a breach of confidence by an employee or a former employee of the employer. A third party may receive confidential information for a number of reasons. It could be for accounting purposes, legal reasons or perhaps an anticipation for example, of a joint venture between two unrelated commercial entities. In the event that confidential information is to be passed to a third party, practical measures should be put in place to help ensure that the confidential information does not make it any further than the third party to whom it is sent. First, before making any disclosure of confidential documents, the disclosing party can require the receiving party to sign an undertaking uh, that will often contain a number of terms, including, uh, for example, that the documents are confidential and the benefit of that confidentiality belongs uh, to the disclosing party. Second, that the provision of the document to the recipient does not amount to any waiver of the confidentiality. Third, that the documents are to be held by the third party in complete confidence and are not to be disclosed to any person without the disclosing party's consent apart from as required by law or regulation. Fourth, that the disclosing party will, be, uh, will immediately be formed by the recipient of any request or order for the disclosure of the documents uh, 
or any of the information contained in the documents. And fifth, that notes, copies or scans of the documents will only be taken by the recipient for a specified purpose and will be destroyed by the third party or returned to the disclosing party once the matter is concluded. An undertaking of this nature clearly demonstrates to both the third party and to the court, if a dispute arises, that the information was imparted in circumstances where the parties knew it was conf confidential. This undertaking will ideally be in addition to some of the more practical measures that are often adopted, marking documents as confidential or colour coding the paper to indicate different levels of confidentiality will help support a subsequent claim that the information was considered to be confidential or a trade secret by the employer. One question that was raised following the last webinar in this series related to restrictions imposed on the receiving party about who in their business was entitled to access the information. This is also known as a confidentiality ring or confidentiality club. Similar restrictions are often agreed during disclosure of documents in litigation. As the disclosing party, defining who within the receiving party's business is entitled to use the information that is disclosed is one way to make clear that the documents are restricted and for a particular purpose. However, as the receiving party, this can often create practical difficulties. Before signing up to this restriction, you should consider whether this is appropriate in the circumstances and also whether it will even be possible to restrict the documents from being disclosed more widely. Ultimately, if the receiving party fails to comply with the restriction imposed, it will be liable for any loss caused as a result. The term should also uh, be made clear to your employees and monitored throughout uh, the transaction or project to identify potential problems, for example, changes to the project team or a need to get input from someone outside the confidentiality ring. As has been explained, the recipient of any confidential information must be left in no doubt that it is a confidential document. This is especially so whether there, there could be any dubiety uh, as to whether it can be protected under the common law. But what happens where the confidential information that's imparted to the third party isn't provided by the business, but is supplied by an employee in breach of confidentiality obligations? The third party may have been given information that's very valuable to them commercially. Um, the concern of the employer is, of course, that the information will be used against them in order to obtain an advantage in the marketplace. So does that third party who receives the information, knowing that it's obtained through breach of a duty of confidentiality, have any obligations to the owner of that information? The answer is yes, but it must be remembered that there is a requirement that the third party receive the information in the knowledge that it was in breach of the employee's duty of confidence. The court will require that the third party was more than just careless or naive in the course of receiving the information. The third party, in order to find itself under on duty to the original party, will need to have some knowledge that the information is confidential and or acted in a way as to be willfully ignorant of the likelihood that the information obtained was acquired in breach of confidence. If this is the case, then the third party who receives the information from the original owner will be under a duty not to disclose or use the information for its own advantage, nor use it to cause damage to the original confider. The final point that we're going to look at briefly today is how to manage confidentiality during a court action. The rules on disclosure or production of documents uh, could be uh, and should be a webinar in itself. Uh, their approach to disclosure in civil litigation is very different north and south, south of the border, and so we aren't going to cover specific issues today. Uh, the reason we're mentioning it today is because it's often where questions of confidentiality are put to the test. During the course of litigation, a party will often face a situation where it is ordered to disclose a document that it views as confidential. Documents over which confidentiality are, is claimed uh, will normally be separated from other non-confidential documents and sealed either physically in a marked envelope or separated and secured electronically. When this happens, the court has to consider a number of issues. First, it will consider whether the doc document in question is relevant to the proceedings. If the document is relevant, then a claim of confidentiality will not necessarily protect the document from disclosure. The court has to carry out a balancing act between the degree of relevance of the documents and the nature and extent of the confidentiality that is claimed. In practice, confidentiality can be claimed for a number of different reasons. One of the most powerful is privilege, 
This is an evidential rule that allows a party to withhold documents or give evidence uh, in relation to a particular subject. Probably the most common is legal professional privilege. This can be divided further into legal advice privilege and litigation privilege. Only communications between a lawyer and the client are protected, and recent uh, English case laws provide a very restrictive view of who the client is for the purpose of legal advice privilege. The client will probably only be those who have authority to seek advice and give instructions. This means that before seeking legal advice, the business needs to think about who the client is and care should be taken when disseminating legal advice with that group of individuals. If disclosure outside the client is necessary, this should be made on express terms that the privilege is not waived. In contrast, litigation privilege is wider in its scope and can extend beyond communication with legal advisors. It will apply to communications with third parties, for example, accountants or other experts. However, in order for litigation privilege to apply, four other condi conditions have to be satisfied. First, the information must be confidential. Second, it must be communicated between a lawyer and the client, uh, or between them and a third party. Third, it must have been created for the dominant purpose of litigation. And fourth, that litigation must be pending, reasonably contemplated, or existing. This means that it is important to understand the point at which litigation is said to be in contemplation. When seeking to rely on litigation privilege, a good test of whether litigation was in contemplation uh, is to consider who the claim would be against, what the grounds of action would be, and where the claim would be raised. It may not always be possible to identify each of these, however, performing the exercise and documenting it will support any later attempt to rely on litigation privilege. This is particularly the case where the litigation contemplated uh, is not progressed. But how do the courts deal with other relationships that give rise to obligations of confidentiality? The issue of contractual obligations of confidentiality was considered in British Steel Corporation and Granada Television. In that case, it was held that a contractual obligation to keep information contained in certain documents strictly confidential could not in itself bar recovery. However, the court will take this obligation into account and may not order recovery if the information could be obtained from another source or if it is not essential. This approach was also endorsed by the Scottish courts in Santa Fe International Corporation and Napier Shipping. Having looked at the different issues that arise in relation to both employees and third parties when coming into contact with confidential information, we're going to close today's webinar by looking at some of the more practical steps that can be taken to protect confidential information. Some examples are shown on the slide um, in summary circulating information to employees only on a need-to-know basis. And by identifying a core team, you reduce the risk of inadvertently losing confidentiality in a document. The next one is marking sensitive information in files, emails, and envelopes containing such information as confidential. Um, if any document contains legal advice or if it's been prepared in contemplation of litigation, then this should also be marked on the document. Next, it seems obvious, but keeping confidential material marked in a lock cupboard or filing cabinet, and where documents are in a digital format, using passwords and encryption software to restrict access to sensitive information in databases. It's possible to prevent documents from being forwarded or printed by the recipient. For example, Microsoft Outlook has a feature called Information Rights Management that allows messages to be created with customized permissions. This makes onward transmission of the advice more difficult, and it reduces the chance of information being disseminated more widely than it was intended. If the technology to do this isn't available, then a simple header or footer in the emails should state that the email should not be forwarded on. Again, we mentioned it earlier, but use of coloured paper for documents with different degrees of confidentiality is also helpful. And having policies in place relating to monitoring of emails, photocopiers and other devices that are used by employees. Um, computer policies minimize risk, and an example of this might be, for example, um, banning the use of USB sticks or disabling CD drives at individual workstations to prevent material being copied. Finally, just having a system that encourages breaches of confidentiality obligations and also potential breaches to be reported will mean that you can help act quickly. Not all of these suggestions will be appropriate in every set of circumstances. However, the important thing to think about is what's needed in advance 
and then to make sure that that process is followed. So that concludes today's webinar, and so there's now some time for you to ask questions. As I mentioned at the beginning, questions be, can be submitted by typing in the chat box, and while you're doing that, I would just like to take the opportunity to mention that there are also a number of other webinar series being run by Shepherd and Wedderburn at the moment, including on property dispute resolution and construction law. If you'd like to find out any more information about these or catch up on previous series, then the link is shown on screen now. It doesn't look like we have any questions, so um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to follow up with us separately after the webinar. Otherwise, we'll just close it there, and thank you for attending. Thank you.